Uh, thank you again. Um, yeah, already uh, the previous three speakers have given the nice um, uh, background to the importance of uh, climate resilient nutrient dense crops, be it millets or legumes. Um, then, you know, how you can actually uh, integrate uh, these uh, improved products through better seed systems and better management practices and take them to a better, um, you know, market opportunities and better nutrition to the uh, stakeholders. So that is in brief the presentation I'm going to cover. So mention has been already made to this um, uh, uh, important uh, event uh, of recent times, International Year of Millets. So between the inaugural in the late, uh, in the early uh, December 2022 to the, you know, um, concluding uh, 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 event uh, in FA Rome, again, both events in FA Rome, um, you know, it signifies a great uh, leap for the millets mainstreaming in the world. So every aspect of what we do or what we think, what we do, everything is impacted uh, a lot by these interventions. But everything, you know, starts with how best we can harness the genetic resources in these millets. Uh, it is very well uh, mentioned already, like, you know, how we design the product profiles based on the requirements of various markets. But the thing is how we best re uh, really use uh, the germplasm or evolutionary advantage the millets have. Uh, which is actually stored in our gene banks can be better unraveled and used in the breeding programs. So this slide gives a snapshot of the millet genetic resources globally available and a part of it, a significant part of it is stored at ICRISAT gene bank, which is uh, freely shareable globally uh, uh, as per the international uh, treaty uh, agreements. And as, as many as 80,000 germplasm accessions are available. Uh, in the millet crops, of course, predominantly it is sorghum and the pearl millet. How uh, we have the largest number of uh, samples, but even in finger millet and small millets, quite significant uh, number of samples are available, which are actually shareable globally. So, um, of course, uh, genetic material or ge uh, these land based actions are uh, are of the best use when they are widely shared and actually put to use in the breeding programs. So in this slide, actually, we wish to um, in, uh, showcase how freely the germplasm is shared globally. You can see all the countries literally, um, which are uh, predominantly actually our developing countries uh, receives maximum germplasm from our gene bank and almost 1.64 million uh, seed samples were shared. And it's every day uh, the number goes up, actually. It's more shared to more than 100, 150 countries, actually. And using this germplasm uh, materials in the breeding programs, more than 1284 varieties are released uh, in the six crops um, that ICRISAT is actually having a mandate. So uh, mention has been already made uh, on the biofortified materials. Yes, um, uh, among the millets, it is pearl millet, wherein the first biofortified cultivar released in 2013. It's widely uh, grown and thereafter a number of other varieties and hybrids have come and it has become a policy actually, uh, you know, wherein uh, the minimum standards are also set in India, uh, courtesy Dr. Tara and her team. Similarly, high iron and zinc varieties are also available in other crops like sorghum, parbani shakti is one such example. It's also protein rich variety actually. And in, in finger millet, a good number of genotypes with high calcium are also released. It's not just a release of varieties, but you know, um, a lot of information, scientific evidence is generated globally, uh, which we have compiled uh, many a times and published, saying that how, when we integrate millets, how they benefit uh, the health or growth of the people who are consuming it, uh, whether it is um, in, the, in the young children, our adolescent girls are pregnant women. In every category of people, millets have shown a, a kind of uh, significant improvement in their growth um, and their uh, metabolic functions and uh, health, actually. So coming to the seed systems, uh, of course, um, um, in this session, we have other speakers are also have uh, uh, the same kind of aspects covered, but I will be very brief. I'll be covering this aspect. 
uh, particularly related to the millet uh, seed systems which we handled. So one of the things is um, most of the times um, um, kind of seed systems are used in a very, very generic term, but uh, we believe that the seed system is very highly context specific. It is specific to a crop, specific to a country or a region even. It, it, it varies with the kind of product you are dealing and also the policy of the nat uh, national governments or regional governments. For example, uh, in a crop like um, sorghum in India, you have hybrid technology, you know, you follow a different seed system, but uh, in, in the post rainy sorghum, um, you know, which comes on a residual soil moisture, uh, you, it's all OPV dominated segment and you take a different seed system. So that means same crop in the same policy environment, but just because the product is different, or the market interests are different, so you follow a different system. So that's how we need to actually uh, develop seed system models to suit to the context. Uh, you know uh, that that's very key. So one of the things we are bringing in is actually a digital uh, seed corridors we are establishing. You know wherein actually we we assess the demand for the seeds. We we actually develop the catalogs of all the released varieties, whether it is millets or legumes or oil seeds we are handling. And we assess the demand for each each of the varieties in these crops, and then we plan for the seed production accordingly. So that is where you know we bring in a lot of tools like forecast, uh, simple online tools which can actually be deployed, uh, which avail which are available free of cost, and a seed producer can actually plan, you know, how much area they want to cover, how much adaptation rates they are expecting depending upon the seed multiplication ratio and all. So we get a clear picture how how much seed has to be produced every year and what category of seed in how much quantity. Once that is done, then the seed production has to be uh, you know done in a very scientific way by ensuring that all the purity, the, particularly the genetic purity is maintained uh, as per the classes of the seeds and prescribed by the policy uh, of the national or regional uh, governments. So that's where we have developed a tool called Empro. You know, this actually uh, enables, you know, the re uh, real time monitoring of the seed production plots, whether it is by the seed farmers or by the groups or the communities or uh, which are done by even public sector seed company or a private sector company. So this is one tool we can actually monitor. And the third one is establishing, you know, traceability uh, end to end in the seed chain, you know, by establishing the barcodes every every packet will have you know all the information digital information like where the seed was produced who has produced which season what is the germination percentage purity everything is mentioned in that so these are the some of the uh, models we have taken you know in each crop for example in hybrids we took a model called hybrid parents research consortium and also licensing of the hybrids that model we have taken in case of OPVs, you know, we have taken up actually decentralized seed productions, wherein by establishing the seed consortiums. So this is one uh, example I wish to share with you. Um, uh, last 24, 25 years, actually, this is uh, in operation in ICRISAT. You know, this we call a hybrid parents research consortium, where actually we bring in all the partners, uh, the public sector, private sector, uh, onto one page, and uh, we we design. Uh, we formulate the research program and we design the product profiles as per the market requirements. And then once uh, we design it, actually, um, the ICRISAT will go ahead uh, by optimizing its breeding pipeline and establishing uh, the best of processes by involving, by selecting the best germplasm and genomic or phenomic tools. You develop the products and then test them. And those parents, what we generate in the process, we will share with both public and private sector. And from there, actually, they make the hybrids and commercialize them. So in this process, actually, um, uh, the private sector will contribute uh, to the research of the program, what we do here, and we provide them the lines. For public sector, everything is free. Uh, they can access any material from anywhere in the world. For private sector, we charge it, uh, which they can pay. And every two years, they can come and select what they want, and they can take it and commercialize. So in this model, actually, um, this is a very, very win-win kind of situation because at any given time, um, you can see hundreds of hybrids uh, coming out uh, from our uh, base material will be uh, in the commercial markets. 
and the hybrids replaced very fastly so that farmers always get uh, new hybrids uh, for, uh, for their uh, commercial cultivation. The companies also get a benefit because they get ready-made parents, you know, which saves a lot of time for them. Farmers get new hybrids quickly and ICRISAT also gets, you know, some resources funding for its research. So this is how we are operating in a very, very coordinated and efficient way in the last 25 years. So while uh, you have better products and uh, better seed systems to take them to the farmers, and there is another important thing is actually to take care of the environment, particularly the natural resources. And already mention has been made, uh, you know, we are working on a number of uh, SDGs, many of us. But see, if two of the SDGs are very, very critical, you know, for example, SDG 2, zero hunger, and also climate action, uh, SDG 13, you know, but there can be a synergy or there can be even a trade-off, you know, how or you can see here. For example, you know, um, if we have to eradicate hunger, we need actually more food. You know, that is the most important bottom line many of us are working for. But to produce more food, we need more inputs. And when we have to use more inputs, particularly the chemical inputs, it needs, it leads to a lot of greenhouse gas emissions and land degradation. So which will be like uh, SDG 13, you know. So, but if you see the opposite direction, if you want to reduce the GHC gas uh, from the agriculture, that means we have to curtail the use of fertilizers. So, but that way, that may actually reduce the food production and cause food insecurity. So, these two things need to be very, very meticulously balanced. So, that's why we promote regenerative agriculture, you know, which is a kind of pathway to eradicate the hunger and also reduce the emissions simultaneously. So, of course, this is not a very new thing. Uh, uh, people are, have called it natural farming or conservation agriculture with little uh, difference in the definitions. But in the regenerative agriculture, it is not just sustaining the resource. Actually, it is improving the resource while you use it. So, basically, so in the regenerative agriculture, we are promoting, uh, you know, um, uh, the focusing mostly on improving the soil health and increasing the biodiversity. Of course, when we actually disseminate lots of millets and legumes into the food chain, the, it can actually significantly enhance the biodiversity and improve the water cycle and supporting the carbon sequestration uh, because a um, lot of biomass gets accumulated and also increasing the climate resilience. So these are the principles with which we operate in the regenerative agriculture. But from a, from a agriculture production perspective, you know, how best we can apply the regenerative practices to achieve the zero hunger and also zero carbon, basically through reducing the yield gaps uh, by better, you know, adoption of uh, improved varieties, improved agronomy and better use of resources, increasing the nutrient efficiencies, uh, reducing the tillage or even zero tillage. For example, you know, in most parts of South Asia, now rice fallows, uh, Right in the rice fallows, you know, without any tillage, under zero tillage conditions, a lot of legumes are grown or some oil seeds are grown. So, which are not only increase the cropping intensity, but it reduces a lot of emissions, reduces cost of cultivation. Similarly, improved water use efficiency is one of the mechanisms and cropping system change by better intensification, diversification, actually we can bring in a much better regenerative agriculture. So more, uh, in, in most cases, of course, the starting point is uh, soil and water. So in the, in the case of water, very, very um, uh, low cost water conservation technologies have been developed uh, by a number of uh, organizations, including ICRISAT. And this has been implemented in, in a number of uh, regions across Asia and Africa. Uh, simple water harvesting uh, mechanisms uh, near the fields even the cultural practices like raised brown, uh, raised buds, buns, then, you know, uh, fallow, ridge and fallow systems, uh, trenches along the field buns, and, uh, you know, using uh, you know, uh, plastic mulches, even biological mulches uh, for uh, water uh, conservation or prevention of evaporation, you know, they can significantly reduce uh, the water evaporation uh, and also increase the infiltration. Of course, water alone is not sufficient. We need to work on the soil health and we need to pump in lots of climate resilient uh, crops and cultivars. 
and maintain the, manage the pests and diseases and improve the markets and uh, institutions and policy support and this needs a great integrated approach so one successful example i wish to quote here is from southern india uh, the state of Karnataka, where uh, more than a million farmers are benefited under a project called Bhujetana, a very long term project, wherein actually all these integrated mechanisms, you know, conservation of water, soil, uh, then, you know, better adoption of improved package of practices, better crop management, and uh, providing market access significantly increased not only the crop yields, reduced the cultivation reduces the pollution, but at the same time increases the farmers' incomes uh, significantly. Another important thing is, of course, uh, many of us are very uh, aware how fertilizer is a crisis in terms of uh, its availability, it costs, its cost, and also the emissions coming out of it. You know, after in agriculture, if in general, if you see, uh, and nitrogen is the second most limiting factor after water. And um, particularly after this green revolution era, there is a significant increase in the demand for nitrogen. And uh, China and India being two largest uh, countries uh, with agriculture, few, big agricultural uh, ge uh, geography, more than 40% of the utilization of N goes for three major crops in these uh, two countries. While our friends in Africa, there is very limited nitrogen, suboptimal use of nitrogen. But if we can really uh, diversify the cropping system uh, with the legumes and also with millets, you know, we can greatly reduce uh, the requirement for nitrogen. In a way, we can reduce the emissions indirectly. So another important tool uh, uh, which can really help uh, in the process is actually use of AI tools uh, for not only weather forecasting, but better detection of uh, nutrient deficiencies, uh, pests and diseases, you know, and we have developed a Plantix app uh, with the help of a German uh, startup. And this is um, in which actually, um, which is freely available, uh, which can be downloaded by anybody globally. By now more than 35 million people have downloaded it and using, which is available in 17 global languages. So every uh, big major language uh, it is available and, and the farmers can actually use this app, you know, by placing in the crop plant you know, it will recognize the pest, it will provide, you know, all the details of the pest and it gives the management practice and also gives an information, you know, where that uh, inputs will be available, whether it is organic material to be sprayed, biologicals, or whether it is chemicals, everything, all the information provides it. And some of the experiences, uh, you know, um, uh, we are currently working, you know, with the help of FAO in Saudi Arabia. Actually, um, which is a desert, uh, we all know, where the rainfall is uh, in some parts of Saudi Arabia, the rainfall is 50 mm per year, actually. So in such soils also, like by better, you know, harnessing the water, you can see the crop. This is a sorghum crop we have grown in, in Jazan region of South, uh, South, uh, Saudi Arabia. And you can see the sorghum seed production in the farmer's fields how nicely it is expressing. So there is an opportunity if we can really pump the better adapted germplasm and uh, use the natural resources properly, uh, we can really harness and produce, um, you know, good quantities. So in case of uh, millets or any crop, it's not just uh, production, but you know, after uh, particularly in the millets, post harvest processing and the market linkage is very, very critical. So uh, we are working with a large number of farmers, farmers groups uh, in various states, particularly this is an example from Eastern India, uh, the state of Odisha, which has a very, very strong millet mission. Predominantly the uh, finger millet is a crop grown. So here we used, you know, a lot of uh, community-based- Excuse me, Ashok. Yeah. Excuse me, would you mind to uh, close your presentation in one minute? Thank yeah. you. Thank you. So here actually a large number of uh, processing plants were established and uh, a lot of ready to use uh, recipes were developed and shared. And these communities are actually now making these uh, products and consuming themselves and uh, selling to the market. And uh, with the help of government, uh, a lot of these millet based and legume based, pulse based products uh, we have disseminated and we have tested with uh, tribal farmers where the malnutrition is very high. Uh, with the support from government of Telangana. 
you know and there was a significant difference this is evidenced and published actually uh, there is a difference in the in the children in terms of their cognitive abilities their growth their hemoglobin content and reduction in their anemia of course a mention has already been made you know it needs lots of partnerships at national level at international level and also with the public private uh, we need to develop so just to summate uh, of course millets are climate smart nutrient dense uh, and they contribute to diversification and um, nutri um, helps in reducing the malnutrition actually and uh, of course market segmentation target product profile development is very very key uh, whether it is millets or any other crop and uh, regenerative agriculture is a great opportunity actually uh, to deploy in our uh, research and development uh, when the soil is healthy it produces of course more better nutrition more crop and increases the diversity and but you know so far we are not doing i mean this is something we need to do in breeding we uh, regenerate to the varieties adapted to regenerative agriculture is something we need to i mean which are more adapted to zero tillage or less tillage so all these mechanisms uh, we need to uh, integrate in the breeding process now and of course innovative seed systems are very very critical to take the any improved product for the farmers but in case of millets particularly the post harvest handling processing market linkage are very very critical and uh, with all this we can diversify the food baskets and we can also protect the environment thank you very much for this opportunity